The Something You Should Know podcast today is sponsored by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial membership by going to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K, S-Y-S-K for Something You Should Know. Both of my guests today have audiobooks available from Audible, and you can get one of them for free just by going to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Today on Something You Should Know, why do you crave salty snacks when you're stressed out? There's actually a very good physiological reason. Plus, you think you make your own decisions, but it is amazing what influences what you really choose. Imagine your neighbor bought the car you were thinking of getting. Uh, You'd say, I should still buy that car. It's the car I like. Yet the fact that they bought it makes us a little less likely to buy it. We're worried we're going to look like a copycat, and we actually avoid doing what we already liked to try to be different. Plus, when you receive an invitation to a party that says no gifts, should you bring one anyway? That and other etiquette rules you may be breaking. And hiring the right person for the job. Why do employers so often get it wrong and hire the wrong person? And we get impressed by degrees, we get impressed by test scores, we get impressed by people who meet us well. Often those are pretty much irrelevant to the job at hand. All this today on Something You Should Know. Something You Should Know. Fascinating intel. The world's top experts and practical advice you can use in your life today. The Something You Should Know podcast with Mike Carruthers. Hi, welcome to the podcast. Today, I want to talk about the decisions that you make. You like to think that the decisions that you make are your decisions, but you are actually influenced in some amazing ways. For example, a hurricane can influence what you name your child. What your friend orders at a restaurant can affect what you order. Just having someone in the room with you can affect how you perform at anything. And sometimes the effect is for the better, and sometimes it's for the worse. It's amazing, and you'll discover a lot about how these influences work and how you can use some of them to your advantage. Also, etiquette rules you might be breaking. Like, do you really have to RSVP to every invitation you get? Or maybe you just figure, well, if they don't hear from me, they'll know I'm not coming. Or do you really have a year to send a wedding gift? I think you'll be surprised by the answers to these and other etiquette questions. Plus, why do employers complain that finding the right person for the job is so difficult? It's a common lament by hiring managers, so either people looking for work aren't very qualified Or perhaps there is something fundamentally flawed about the whole hiring process. I'll be speaking with George Anders. He is an expert on this. So if you're looking to hire or if you're looking to be hired, I promise you'll get some valuable intel when you listen to the conversation with George Anders in just a while. And let's start the podcast today with the subject of salty snacks. And let me ask you, when you're stressed out, do you find that you crave salty something? Would you rather have a bag of potato chips or would you rather have something sweet like candy? Chances are you pick the salty potato chips and here's why. Animal research at the University of Florida suggests that consuming salt can actually decrease the amount of stress hormones like cortisol that are released during psychological stress. And it's likely that the same thing happens in humans too. And it doesn't take much. Raising your body's sodium level by just 1-2% to is enough to suppress the production of those stress hormones. And it also seems that the body's oxytocin levels, and that's a a feel-good hormone that's associated with pleasure and comfort, that the, the level of oxytocin increases when you increase your intake of salt. And that is something you should know. The subject of influence. We spend a good part of our day trying to influence other people and get them to do what we want. But what makes someone influential exactly? And what are the factors that really do influence people? It's a fascinating subject. And my guest is Jonah Berger. A few years ago, he wrote a book called Contagious, which looked at why some things catch on and become popular and go viral and other things don't. 
It was a, a fascinating book, and his new book is called Invisible Influence. Jonah Berger is a professor at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And so, Jonah, there seem to be some people that are just more influential than others. Is it a, is it a talent? Is it a special gift or what? Not so much. Uh, You know, we definitely have people in our own lives that that seem to be more influential, but we can be more influential ourselves if we understand what makes people influential in the first place. Um, Some researchers looked at negotiators to try to figure out what made certain negotiators more successful, and they found that one simple trick uh, led negotiators to be much more successful, to reach better outcomes uh, and get a bigger slice of the pie. And that trick very simply was imitating their negotiating partner. Uh, Their negotiating partner crossed their legs. They did the same thing. Their negotiating partner uh, rested their hand on uh, their cheek on their hand. They did the same. Subtly imitating or mirroring the mannerisms, the words, the language uh, used by someone else led negotiators to be more successful. Same same thing actually in a sales context. So in a a restaurant engagement, uh, for example, if the waiter or waitress uh, reads your order back to you word for word, they just got a 70% higher tip. Uh, and so it's not just that certain people are naturally more influential than others. They use some of these tools that we ourselves can use. We don't just want to listen to others. We want to emulate them as well, whether their language or their mannerisms. Uh, the more we seem similar, uh, the more likely they'll be to like us, to trust us, and the better those interactions will go. I imagine most people would think, gosh, that seems so simple and so uh, elementary that it it couldn't work. How could that be a way to be influential just by mirroring back? Or So there must be other ways that we don't think of that are kind of below the radar there that, that work, What correct? Yeah. And, you know, in this case, imagine you and I are chatting and we find out we have the same birthday, we went to the same high school. Suddenly we feel like we have more in common. We feel a kinship. We like each other more, we trust each other more, and our interactions go better. And that's exactly what mimicry does. But mimicry is only one of the the dozens of uh, subtle and often surprising tools that that I talk about in the book. And another great one is the power of peers to motivate us. How can we use others to help us reach our our goals? Um, And it turns out that peers can be a great way to do things we couldn't do uh, otherwise. People tend to work harder when others are around. Cyclists race faster, runners run faster, people work harder when others are present. And so rather than trying to hit our goals by ourselves, we can use others to help us get there. Working out at the gym, for example, rather than at home, or going running with someone else rather than running alone will help us run faster, work out harder, and as a result, be more successful. Yeah, well, you talk about um, how new products should be different but not too different. How does that fit into this discussion? Yeah, there are different flavors uh, of influence. Sometimes people do the same thing as others. Sometimes they do something different. And sometimes they do something in between. And this this in-between is really important when launching a new product or idea. Uh, I think a good way to think about it is is pitching like Goldilocks from Goldilocks of, of Three Bears fame. Usually we think it's all about being different a new product or service, we want to talk about how different it is uh, than something people have seen before. If they feel like it's different, they'll want it and will be successful. But if you look actually at successful companies and ideas, they tend not to be different. When you think about Google and Apple, for example, as succeeding because they're different, but Apple actually wasn't the first, or Google wasn't the first to introduce the things they've become synonymous for. Google wasn't the first company to do online search. They just did it a little better than someone else. Apple wasn't the first to introduce the digital music player. They just did it better than someone else had done. Um, And so if you actually look at the data, it's not about being different. It's about being optimally distinct, similar and different at the same time. You know, if something is too different, people think it's scary. I don't know how to use this. I don't know how to fit this in uh, to my existing world. Why should I buy this if I don't know how I'm going to use it? At the same time, if something is too similar, exactly the same as what we're doing already, What's the what's the reason to switch? Why do we need to put the effort in to do something different? In between is just right. Just like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know, one side's too hot, one side is too cold, but in the middle is just right. When we mix similar and different, when we're optimally distinct, that's when companies and ideas end up being successful. Similar enough to feel familiar, to, so people understand it, they can see how it fits in their life, but different enough to feel novel, feel distinctive, and feel worth adopting. Give me some other um, examples of this, because I mean, there's so many in the book. Of, uh, you say that uh, successful athletes have older siblings. Is, is that going back to the idea of, of having peers that push you along? 
It's both. It's actually being similar and, and, and different uh, at the same time. When, when researchers looked at uh, what makes elite athletes successful, what they have in common, they found that a lot of them had older brothers or sisters. Uh, and you might think it's all about uh, older brothers and sisters playing the same sport. So uh, if your older brother or sister plays tennis, you sort of you know, follow them along to the, their tennis lessons, and you pick up a racket earlier, and you play with them, and you learn, and you compete, and so you get better. Uh, but it turns out that actually wasn't the case. Um, elite athletes had older brothers and sisters, and those older brothers and sisters tended to play sports, but they were often a different sport uh, from what uh, the younger child ended up succeeding at. And so why was that, was that helpful? Well, it turns out that uh, older siblings do two things. One, they provide a guide, uh, a person to follow to do something, a competitor to get better, but they also provide something to contrast yourself against. If your older brother and sister is really good at tennis, it's going to be hard to be better than them at tennis. They've got a head start on you. They're taller, they're bigger, and they're probably going to be much better. And so younger siblings don't just follow. They also differentiate. They try to separate themselves and craft their own path. Uh, if their brother or sister is good at tennis, maybe they take up baseball. And the same thing in our own families. If an older brother or sister is the smart one, we become the funny one. If they're the artsy one, we become the sporty one. And so those individuals in our lives, in this case, our siblings or our family members, uh, shape our behavior often without us even realizing it. Well, it's interesting when we think about the choices that we make, and we don't really think why we make them. We pick this thing over that thing, or we do this thing over that thing. And, and But if we stop and think, well, if we stop and think, you know, why we pick one can of pasta sauce over another would we be able to figure it out, or is it all just happening behind the scenes? It often is happening below our awareness, often in a way we don't even realize. We did a bunch of research on baby names, looking at why people pick a given name for their child. And if you ask people, they'll give you an answer. People say, oh, I picked this name because it's similar to my aunt's name, or oh, it was similar to a friend's uh, name that I had growing up. And yet, while we all have these idiosyncratic individual reasons for picking names, when we, our kids get to kindergarten, they often end up having the same name as two or three other kids in their class. And so if it's all about being different, how do everyone end up being the same? If we're all trying to separate ourselves. How do we end up being similar? Well, it turns out that without our awareness, we're subtly influenced by what names are popular at the moment. Uh, if, uh, let's say, Lisa's popular, for example, we may not name our child Lisa, but we're more likely to name them Lindsay or Larry, other names that begin with that L sound. Or similarly, hurricanes. Uh, Hurricane Katrina comes around. You'd think no one would name their child Katrina after that. Yet Hurricane Katrina has a big, significant impact on naming patterns. 10% more babies were born with K names after Hurricane Katrina. Again, not the same name as Katrina, but a slightly different name. Because hearing Katrina more often made those K names sound better, and as a result, we adopted them. And so even simple things like how good something sounds is not just driven by our own personal preferences. Sometimes it's driven by the things we hear and see in our surrounding environment. But what about once you have a personal preference, is it pretty hard to move people away from that, even with all the things we know or that, well, that you know? <laughs> I don't know them yet. But um, because people have latched onto something, once they have, then it's tough to move them? You would think so, but it's actually surprisingly easy to change people's behavior. You know, imagine you're out to dinner, for example, with a group of friends, uh, and you're hungry, so you start perusing the menu, you figure out what entree you like, and your stomach starts rumbling, you can't wait for the waiter to come over. Finally, after a couple minutes, they come over, they start taking orders, your friend of yours orders, and they end up ordering the same entree that you were thinking of getting, the exact same thing. And then it comes to you. Do you pick the same thing, or do you pick something different? And, you know, as individuals, uh, as people who think they're independent, we'd love to say, well, yeah, I'll stick with the same entree. Of course, you know, why would I change my, my choice? Yet we don't. Overwhelmingly, people end up changing what they were going to pick, picking something else um, because their friend chose it, and it makes them less happy as a result. They end up being less satisfied uh, with the entree they chose. And so even in this case, it's not just about following others. Sometimes it's about differentiating ourselves, and, and that's why I find influence so interesting. You know, they're different flavors. Sometimes we're similar. Sometimes we're different. Sometimes we're optimally distinct, right in the middle. Sometimes others motivate us. Sometimes others demotivate us. And by understanding these subtle and often surprising influences, we can take advantage of their upsides and avoid their downsides. You know, that's an interesting uh, example, uh, one I've often wondered about. If you're going to have the whatever dish 
and somebody else orders it first, why should that influence your choice now? They should get what they want, and you should get what you want. And and, and yet, you're right, people change because they don't want to be look, look like a copycat, I guess, or something. Yeah, I mean, imagine your neighbor bought the car you were thinking of getting. Uh, you'd say, oh, well, I should still buy that car. It's the car I like. Yet the fact that they bought it makes us a little less likely to buy it. We're worried we're going to look like a copycat. We're worried we're going to look like exactly the same as them. And so we don't, uh, we don't imitate, and we actually avoid doing what we already liked to try to be different, to try to be distinct. What can cockroaches teach us about motivation? (laughs) So a great study was done by a number of uh, researchers looking at what motivates people to action. Uh, In this case, they didn't look at people. They looked at cockroaches. They had cockroaches run little races, so they ran down a track trying to hide away from light, and they timed how fast they ran. Uh, What they found is that cockroaches ran faster when other cockroaches were around. A little cockroach ran faster down the the track if other cockroaches were watching that cockroach. And Indeed, decades of research has shown the same thing for people. We do things, many things, though not all things, faster and better when other people are around. If you're tying your shoes, for example, you're faster to tie your shoes if someone's watching you. Uh, and similarly, if you're running in a race or uh, uh, you know, biking, uh, we're faster to run or bike when, when other people are around. The mere presence of others don't have to be competing with us, but the mere presence motivates us to work harder, but not always. We've always had, uh, we've often had that experience, for example, where you're trying to parallel park and someone else is in the car and you find yourself having more trouble uh, than you usually do. If you've ever tried to tie a bow tie, it's difficult to begin with, but it's even more difficult when a bunch of people are watching you. So when do others make us work faster and harder and when do others make it more difficult for us to get stuff done? Turns out it depends on the type of task we're doing. For things that are easy to begin with, things that we've done a number of times, well, others help us do them faster and better. But for things that we're not so good at, things that are difficult, like parallel parking or tying a bow tie, the mere fact that others are present makes it harder for us to do them well. Isn't that interesting? But you, you're right, it's true. I mean, if, it, if you're having trouble with something, having somebody watch you makes it more difficult for some reason. And you, you, I guess you're more self-conscious of how you're screwing this up or something. <laughs> or something. But you're right. Yeah, it's it it's really amazing. So knowing knowing what you know and understanding that all these things are going on, well what can we do with that information? How how do you then corral all this and start using it to your advantage? Well, the first thing is awareness, right? If we're if we're aware of influences, you know, we're often not, but if we become more aware, if we become attuned to how they're shaping us and Uh, how they're playing a role in our environment, we can take advantage of them. Influence is not a bad thing. Often it can be a good thing. Uh, It can help us make decisions faster and easier than we would otherwise. Uh, And it can motivate us like we talked about. It can encourage us to work harder and perform better than we would. Yet sometimes it leads us astray. Sometimes we make worse decisions when, when others are around. And so by beginning to understand influence, how it works and how it shows up in the world, we can take advantage of its upsides and avoid its downsides. And that's really why I wrote Invisible Influence. There's lots of scientific research on influence, but most of us still don't see it. And if we can begin to see it, that's how we can use it. Well, going back to the idea that having people around helps helps you do better and faster and, and all that, what is it about that? What's the magic ingredient that's causing that? What's going on in a person's head that says, people are watching me, I'll do this better? It's called social facilitation. That's the the technical term for it. And whether it's a cockroach uh, running down uh, a race or whether it's a person uh, working at the office, others get our competitive juices flowing. uh, And they also uh, generate uh, physiological arousal. They fire us up and they ready us to take action. Uh, they make it easier for us to engage in the dominant responses or the things that we're, we're already good at. And in some sense, others facilitate what we're already used to doing. But again, whether that's good or bad depends on the thing we're doing. Others make it easier for us to do well-learned things, but more difficult to combat the stuff that we're often used to doing. Having other people around, for example, makes us stereotype more because we're used to the default tendency is to stereotype. And so others around makes us more anxious and we default to those usual tendencies, which in some cases can make us worse off than we would be otherwise. I imagine, too, it depends on who's around, that, that something that you might do better with your peers around might be more difficult if your boss is standing there staring at you. 
Certainly. And it also depends on where they are in relation to us. We did a bunch of research on NBA basketball and, and found that teams – uh, that halftime uh, affected their performance at the end of the game in a particular way. Being ahead was generally a good thing, but teams that were behind by just a little were, were more likely to win. Not teams that were far behind. They were far behind, they'd get demotivated and give up. But teams that were behind by just a little got motivated more, they worked harder, and, and they closed the gap. And so thinking about the people we surround ourselves with is really important. Uh, if we're trying to motivate ourselves to work harder uh, at the gym or at, uh, at work or lose weight or exercise, we need to surround ourselves with the right people, pick our peers carefully, uh, and use that influence. It's really amazing, because when you talk about this, I mean, there's all these things going on around us that are in some ways in, in, invisible, or, or at least the, the force field is invisible, and we don't make those connections, and yet it's happening to us like 24 hours a day. It, it's hard to think of a, a choice we make or a behavior we engage in that is not in some way, shape, or form uh, affected by others. Uh, but again, if we if we understand it, if we can see it, if we can recognize it, that's how we can take advantage of it. Great. The book is Invisible Influence. It's by Jonah Berger, and there is a link to the book and to his website on the show notes page of our website, somethingyoushouldknow.net. Thanks, Jonah. Thank you so much. Good to chat. And you should know that Jonah's book, Invisible Influence, and his earlier book, Contagious, which I just loved, both of those books are available as audiobooks from audible.com, and you can get either one of them for free or any of the thousands and thousands of audiobooks that Audible has. You can get one book downloaded for free plus a free 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. S-Y-S-K stands for something you should know. Now, audible.com has, I think it's, over 200,000 titles to choose from. And if you haven't gotten into the audiobook thing, I mean, it is so addicting once you start to be able to just listen to a book on your phone, your Kindle, your MP3 player, and you can get a free book and test it all out by going to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. And as I said, Jonah's books are available, and my next guest book is available for a free download at audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Finding the right talent. It's something a lot of employers struggle with, and they end up making decisions to hire that they later regret, and then they have to fire someone, and all of that can be very costly. And the reason hiring managers have such a difficult time finding the right person is they don't know how to do it. They they haven't had any formal training. And and I don't even know if there is such a thing as formal training on how to hire someone. George Anders is a journalist who has written for the Wall Street Journal and Fast Company Magazine and now Bloomberg. And he's the author of a book called Rare Find, Spotting Exceptional Talent Before Everyone Else. And George... It's interesting to me that as important as it is for finding the right person for a job, employers seem to have such a lousy track record at it. No matter what beat I've covered, one of the big questions has always been, how do we get great people and how do we sort out the mysteries of talent? So it could be a college admissions director trying to figure out where do I find the the right students from this huge stack of applications. Uh, It could be an investment manager. How do I figure out people who can beat the stock market? Uh, I could be a venture capitalist. How do I find the next Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos? And I wanted to pull together all these different ideas into one book and offer the best stories and the best insights that I could about how do you solve the talent mystery. Why is it a a mystery? Why is it that people don't do this automatically? And and I know from my own experience of having had to hire people and whatever and talking to other people who've done it, it seems that people aren't particularly good at seeing talent. Hiring is a very humbling thing. I and mean, you think you know who's good, and it's amazing how often you'll get surprised in both directions. I mean, there, there are two issues going on. One is human beings are complicated, so there's a lot to evaluate, and it's, it's hard to prioritize. Um, but the other problem is we tend to latch on to the superficial, and we get impressed by degrees, we get impressed by test scores, we get impressed by people who meet us well, and 
often those are pretty much irrelevant to the job at hand. And sometimes it's the sleeper candidate, the one who's not dazzling in the first five minutes, who turns out to have an awful lot to offer. And the ones who are really good at making first impressions and not much more um, end up falling down on the job. And it's very hard to compensate for that, that we, we want to like people. It tends to be more of a courtship than an evaluation. And the moment you decide you're falling in love, uh, your judgment um, pretty much shuts down. Yeah. Well, we've all been there. And, and, you know, so much effort is made in helping people, quote, make a good first impression. Um, but what else do you have to go on in those few minutes? I mean, it, other than those degrees and, and what the person says in that first impression? So let me offer you something where so often our feet are pointed the right way and where I was really impressed when I was researching the book, The Rare Find. Um, and that is the importance of resilience, people who can bounce back from setbacks. And I think the way we construct our resumes these days, we try and make it everything look like unbridled success. We started at a small place, we got promoted, we went to a bigger place, and boy, we, you know, we've just been on the, the road up. But when you think about people who succeed in any field, and I went into teaching, I went, uh, you know, looked at examples from the military, uh, looked at examples from finance, and it's often the people who can bounce back from trouble. Because things will go wrong in any job. You're going to end up in situations that weren't what you planned. And what you really want are the kinds of people who can sort out a difficult situation and land on their feet. Uh, I watched Teach for America do some screening of teacher candidates. And their, one of their key tests is to interrupt people in the middle of a lesson plan. How do you deal with a crazy interruption? Well, you know what? If you're going to go teach in the inner city in L.A. or Miami or Chicago, you're not going to be able to do your beautiful 50-minute lesson plan. You're going to have kids who have to go to the bathroom or kids who are doing heaven knows what. And if you're going to be a good teacher, you've got to be able to handle that kind of disruption. So they look for people who can do that, and they get better teachers that way. There also seems to be, in fact, I just interviewed someone the other day, and and I hadn't really thought about this all that much, but it, it rang true to me that... When you're trying to impress somebody or whatever, that people are more drawn to people who have overcome a struggle than people who have had what, as you mentioned, like unbridled success, that they, they've just hit it out of the park every time, as opposed to the story of struggle is a lot more appealing than the story of I can do everything. Absolutely. I mean, who is the the president in the history of the United States who gets the highest approval and admiration ratings? Abe Lincoln. And his life story is trying to overcome one failure after another. And he ended up being an extraordinarily powerful president in, surprise, a situation that was totally different from what he expected. He was elected in peacetime and he spent his entire presidency dealing with war. Uh, You want someone who knows how to work through the hard stuff. And I, I think the more that organizations can look for the Abe Lincolns of the world, as opposed to, just to pick a different example from that era, the General Custers, uh, the better off they're going to be. But how in the short amount of time that we have to choose somebody for a project or hire somebody to, to work here or whatever, in the short time you have, uh, now that we know what we usually work for is probably a, a false positive, what do we look for? How, and how do you do it quickly? So let me jump on a little piece of your question. When you started about short time, one of the techniques that impressed me among venture capitalists is to stretch out the clock. And when they're thinking about funding someone, they will often come up with minor delays, reasons, what have you, why they can't make a decision just yet. And what they're really doing is they want to see how someone performs over a two, three, four, five-week period and how much of what they promised they could do in that beautiful first meeting starts to happen because they're looking for efficiency. They're looking for follow through. And you can't see that in one static moment. You need to let time play out. And then you discover these are people who cross items off their do list one after another. And by Thursday afternoon, they've got done everything they told you they were going to do Monday. Or these are people who come the next Monday, their do list looks exactly the same or it's grown bigger because they've got a million ideas and they never execute. So sometimes it's as simple as, you know, stretch out the the review period, you know, ask someone to do something for you, uh, give them a test I and mean, try them out on what you're looking for. And that way you get to see their actual work. It's not just, you know, can they talk the talk? Can they actually deliver what you're looking for? I guess the people are a little reluctant or hesitant to do that because, 
you know, how can I ask this person to work when I haven't hired him yet? Or you know. in an economy with nine point one percent unemployment and you know close to five people available for every job opening, it's amazing what as an employer you can ask, and you know you, you still need to be within the bounds of decent human conduct, but you're allowed to set some pretty high bars, and uh, there are a lot of people out there who are willing to do whatever it takes to make a good impression and to show that they deserve that job. Uh, and right now, all the, the power is on the side of the person doing the hiring as opposed to the candidate. There is something kind of fascinating about how what you talk about, the, the, the finding the right people to do the right thing or whatever, is so important. And yet, this is not something anybody ever really talks about. And yet, it, and, and I've heard uh, employers who have been surveyed say that they think they suck at, at hiring and that they're afraid of it and that, that it's a very stressful kind of time. And nobody's good at this. Yeah, I found when I was doing the interviews for the book that uh, a lot of the the people, this is very private, personal stuff. It takes a while for them to open up. And some of them are on their own still trying to figure out how they do it. I interviewed one of the top book editors in the world, and he had told me, you know, I've had great success signing up authors whose books have gone on to do really well. I'm not sure how I do it. So part of the fun of the research was to sit down with people and say, okay, let's pick it apart one step at a time. Let's look at the way you ask questions. Let's look at how you screen candidates. And I found three categories that traditional hiring, I think, doesn't do as much as it could. And these are the big areas of focus in the book. Uh, The first is people with jagged resumes. They've got some elements of great success and some elements of apparent failure. And you need to know when the flaws don't matter and when the successes are crucial. Uh, The second is talent that whispers, people that you uh, ordinarily would overlook because they're in the wrong town or the wrong age or somehow they're they're on the the wrong side of your moat and you never take them in and you need to be able to widen your gaze and take them in. And the last is being realistic about talent that shouts, people who are obvious high achievers. But in some cases, if you don't have great motivation and great commitment, I mean, we see this in sports all the time, uh, the athlete who can run a 40-yard dash faster than anyone but doesn't come to practice. And I think a lot of companies end up having to deal with the same issue. Of you, can, uh, you can be enchanted by what someone could be, but until you know what they really want to be, uh, you're not going to get that level of performance. I've always wondered if, and I don't know if you looked at this specifically, but, but you'll, you'll get the idea that there's so much emphasis put on, for example, when you're going on a job interview, your resume can't have holes in it, and that holes in the resume is a red flag. But has anybody ever tracked people with holes in their resume who got hired, and did, that, did there seem to be any correlation to people with, with holes in their resume where they weren't working and their ability to perform? You know, in some cases, it actually tilts the other way. I mean, who are the best-known Harvard uh, students of modern times? Bill Gates and uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the founders of Microsoft and Facebook. Did either of them graduate? No, they're both dropouts, and they just chose a path that did not involve finishing college. And if you think about conventional hiring wisdom, you got to get your degree. If you didn't get your degree, you're not worth hiring. Uh, guess what? Sometimes that's not true. On, and at Google, one of the things they found, they will rate people on a one to five scale and each interviewer will do the rating. Some of their best hires have ended up being the people who got a one, which is basically a ding from someone because they were controversial, but they had enough people championing them that you had to go with the person that evoked sharply mixed feelings as opposed to the one where everyone said, yeah, they're pretty good. And being able to take a chance on that person that, um, that does have a hole in the resume um, can make a big difference. But of course, the, the question comes down to, well, it, you know, is this the guy worth taking a chance on? Because there must be some value in the, the notion or the theory that you've got to be careful with people with jagged work histories and, and that kind of thing. There must be something to that. So it depends enormously on what field you're in. I mean, when I was doing the early research, I talked with someone in the art dealer business. How do you find talent? And he said, I'll just walk up to you know, artists and say, surprise me show me something I've never seen before. 
And when you're in a field where taste is that fluid and changing, and in the end, if you exhibit an artist who's unpopular, it's not like the world's come to an end. You just didn't sell any of his stuff. You could not run an airline that way. You could not go up to pilot candidates and say, surprise me. Uh, You don't want someone who's going to land a plane in a way that it's never been landed before. You want someone who's steady and predictable. So, uh, you know, I can draw up a chart for you of what's your tolerance for risk. And there's a whole bunch of fields that are on the left-hand side where safety and reliability are essential. But there's also a group of fields where creativity matters more. Uh, I spent time interviewing the people who do the MacArthur Genius Awards. And that is a surprise me field. You're looking for someone who uh, has done something that hasn't been done before and can stretch human achievement into places we haven't gone before. And in those cases, you're much more willing to, um, to take that chance. So it does depend on what field you're in. But creativity is important. And even in fields that traditionally weren't defined by creativity, if you look at where the growth is, it's usually the people who are coming up with fresh, unexpected ideas. What about the idea that making a good first impression and dazzling people to, you know, hey, look at me, look at me, and yet there are plenty of us who are more introverted and are, are not comfortable and really can't do that, are, are, and I imagine those people tend to be overlooked to some degree, but is there something those people can do within their comfort zone to get the light shined, uh, shone, shined, shined on them? Illuminated, yes. Uh, oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> you know, some of it is is finding people who've had a similar path than you, and I, I have a whole chapter devoted to the idea that you should draw on your own life experiences, that I think we've made hiring so neutral and uh, dispassionate that we've lost that ability to say, I'm looking for people who um, whose lives I can understand. I, an, an example that came to mind, uh, Johns Hopkins Medicine, their dean of admission is one of the top medical schools in uh, America, probably in the world. And he's a guy who spent his whole college days thinking he was going to be a concert oboist. And in the end, you know, backed out of that track and came to medicine late and needed a bunch of catch-up courses. He's got a real eye for other people who you know, may have started out as a you know, Chicago detective, who may have started out as a, as a fisherman, all sorts of other fields, who then say, you know what, I want to be in medicine. And uh, he's willing to open the door for them. You might not get that from someone who knew they wanted to be a doctor from age six onward. But the nice thing is, it's a big world that if some place is looking for glitz and glamour and that's not you, there's bound to be some other place that will look for people who've got the slow and steady sort of small blue flame approach to life. Right. And, um, you know, pair up with places that can make the most of you and you know, look at it from the other direction. Uh, hire people who, who've got the kind of strengths you know can succeed. When people look for talent in their organization, one of the things that they... Uh, they look at and, and give, I think, a lot of weight to is the person's ability to fit in and and may sacrifice talent because the person doesn't fit in. How important do you think fitting in is? Fit is crucial, and I think the right sacrifice to make is experience. I and mean, you can give up a bit on, you know, you don't need to find people who've done this for 15 years or even five years. If you find someone who's got the right attitude, who's motivated well, who gets the hang of your culture, you can always learn skills. Uh, and I'll give you an example that really stood out for me. I spent time with uh, Army Special Forces and their selection process, it runs 19 days. They don't have soldiers fire a single bullet. Uh, they say, we can teach people how to shoot. Some people will learn faster than others, but if you're willing to spend a lot of time on the range, we will make you into an excellent shot. We don't need to find out how well you shoot. Uh, What we do need to find out is, can you go on long marches in harsh conditions and still keep your act together at the end of the day? Are you a team guy? Do you care about how the other soldiers are doing? Uh, Can you deal with you know, challenges that may not have a solution. They, they give them one exercise where they've got to put together a conveyance of a busted old cart, and the, the equipment they give them is not going to get the job done. And there are like five different not very good ways you can solve it, and that's really all there is. And what they're looking for is can people still keep going and make the best of it? Because guess what? Out in battle, you're going to have a bunch of situations like that, too. There may not be a brilliant plan. You've got to pick something that will sort of work and do the best you can with it. Uh, So they're looking for character. They're looking for temperament. And those are the right things to concentrate on. And then you can build on that. Then people will get better and better. 
So uh, trying to find someone who's fully formed and has all the technical skills but doesn't have the right frame of mind, you're going to be disappointed with that person. They won't grow in the job, and if anything, they may deteriorate in their performance. Well, what you've shared here, uh, George, is, I mean, this is really some valuable intel for anybody who is in the position of having to hire someone and needs to get the right person in the right job and get it done right the first time. This, this is really good stuff, as well as being valuable information for people who are looking for work as well. Thank you, George. George Anders is a writer for Bloomberg, and he is author of the book The Rare Find, Spotting Exceptional Talent Before Everyone Else. There's a link to his book on the show notes page for this episode of the podcast at somethingyoushouldknow.net. So, how is your etiquette? A lot of etiquette rules today just aren't followed anymore, not like they used to be. And that's probably okay in some cases, but there are some etiquette rules that make a lot of sense and should still be followed, according to Good Housekeeping magazine, because it just makes life easier for everybody. So here are a few, for example. You should always RSVP to every invitation you get. And people don't, if you've hosted a party or an event, you know that a lot of people just never tell you. They don't, maybe they assume, if you don't hear from me, I guess I'm not coming. But it really helps the host plan better, and it shows that you're thoughtful. When an invitation says no gifts, don't bring a gift. You'll embarrass the other guests who obeyed the request, and if you want to give a gift, that's fine, but do so privately, but don't bring a gift to a party whose invitation said no gifts. When you ask people to come to a restaurant to, say, celebrate your spouse's birthday, You can't expect them to pay for their own food. If the party was at your house, you wouldn't ask people to pay. And you shouldn't at a restaurant either. You're the host. You should pay the bill. And if you can't afford it, then you either invite fewer friends or do it at home. You shouldn't use a speakerphone without asking if it's okay with the person you're talking to. That person on the other end of the line may want the call to be confidential. They may not want anyone else to hear. Plus, it's also hard to hear people when they're talking on a speakerphone. Don't talk about, I like this one, don't talk about children in their presence as if they're not there. Instead of asking a parent how old is she, ask the child directly. It's more respectful and the child will most likely be happy to tell you. And don't wait to send a wedding gift until after the wedding. This whole idea, and I've heard this forever, that you have a year to send a wedding gift It's not true. The gift is to celebrate the event, not the one-year anniversary of the event. Wedding gifts should be sent or brought at the time of the wedding. And that is something you should know. Our sponsor today is Audible.com. Both of my guests today, their books are available as audiobooks at audible.com, and you can get one of them for free, plus a 30-day free trial, by going to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. That's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K for your free audiobook and 30-day free trial from audible.com. That's the podcast today. I'm Mike Carruthers. Thanks for listening to Something You Should Know.